الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد um, We have before us a dilemma And that is we only have four topics Of four more sessions I mean And we have a lot of uh, information left Originally I had requested 20 uh, lectures And I was given 18 And I missed one last yesterday Because I was feeling ill So we only have 17 And we've only got four of those 17 left So we're really going to have to move to the material Sort of quickly And I apologize But, um, but what, I, what I want to do is I don't want to uh, I mean if I was to keep it at the same level of detail We wouldn't finish all I wanted to talk about And rather than leave, just do half of the course Or two thirds of the course I think it's better to probably uh, Do the whole course Even though part of the course Is not as great detail And I apologize for that um, But this is the first time I'm teaching a sort of fiqh And so perhaps um, I don't uh, have that type of ease with the topic uh, As I would like a topic like Aqidah Which I've been teaching for a number of years Or fiqh Okay, um, so I think we had a question from last class. No, if there's a question, we should just you know. Really get there. Yes. Right. Yeah, that's an indi- that's an indication that the matter is haram usually, um, and so therefore it's an indication that the matter is prohibited. Um, his letters in an usul al-fiqh sense in terms of definition I don't think it would enter into that how do the the scholars of usul al-fiqh deal with his letters specifically uh, I don't know and that's something that should be an investigation Uh, alright you remember the last topic which we had to sort of come to an end to last time uh, was concerning the prohibitions I just want to repeat was I said that if there is a command after a prohibition it returns it back to the state prior to the prohibition. And the best example uh, is those initial verses uh, from the fifth surah of the Quran, Surah Al-Ma'idah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbids hunting, all right, while you're in the state of ihram, okay, and then commands it after you have come out of the state of ihram. Now, the command, okay, even though it falls under one of those four number forms of how a command comes, right, we will not say that the command here is Wajib. I mean, it's not after you finish Hajj required for you to go hunt. But rather, what happens is, is that this command, retur- after a prohibition, returns it to the state prior to the prohibition. And hunting, the ruling for hunting, prior to its prohibition, during the time of wearing your ihram, is what? Mubah. So therefore, this command returns it back to its mubah. And remember, if we said that, that the command is indicative of it being obligatory unless there's some sort of evidence, right, which shows it to be mustahab, okay, or shows it to be permissible, right, uh, mubah. I guess that was so clear. Yes? Okay, prohibition, right? Right. Right. So it, it makes it, it makes it prohibited. It doesn't throw it back. But oh, excuse me. No, that's why, and, and that's why the hadith calls on some of those. Uh, Especially in the case of Mut'ah, it's very clear when it said until the day of judgment, it should forbid it. Yeah. Now, right now, we're coming into problem which I think, at least when I was studying the Sulu Sikh, when they taught it to me, was probably the most difficult part of the Sulu Sikh I found. And that's the interpretation of the sources of law. Okay, you have these commands, you have these prohibitions, or you have these hadith, you have these ayat of the Quran, how do you interpret them? And this is really basically built upon, in to large degrees, uh, Arabic language. And when a person's uh, native tongue is not Arabic, or a person's knowledge of the Arabic language is not uh, sufficient, uh, invariably, he finds difficulty with this topic. So we're going to try our best, since we're teaching this in English, to try to make some sort of sense out of this. And um, again, uh, this is an introductory course, so as long as we get a flavor 
of what the aim is, right? I think we'll have achieved something to that. Uh, the first matter is regarding the literal and the, fig- the figurative, right? Uh, the literal in the Arabic language is known as al haqiqa which is written in Arabic like this. And the figurative is known as al-majaz. <coughs> and in general, uh, the scholars have differed regarding the existence of the figurative in the Arabic language or its existence in the Sharia initially. Uh, the reason why, because uh, some scholars feel that the idea that there is some words which are figurative in the Arabic language uh, was an innovation used by those who interpreted the divine attributes to mean figurative matters and not accept them literally. For instance, to interpret Allah's attribute of possessing hands to mean his power. All right? They interpreted uh, that. They said, that, well, therefore... Uh, like the verse in the Quran which says, uh, O Iblis, right, Surah 38, verse 75, O Iblis, why did you not prostrate to that which I created by my two hands? Now, the belief of the earliest Muslims was that this is an indication that Allah has two hands and it's to be interpreted as it is literally without resembling Allah's hands with those of his creation. Later on, different sects appeared where they said, no, that Allah's hands are figurative, and uh, it means his power or his blessings, or I mean, depending upon the interpretation they gave to it. So, this figurative they call al-majaz, and the literal was known as al-haqiqa. And since usul al-fiqh was developed uh, to a great extent by the uh, people who we would call the Ash'aris, right? The Bible says there were two schools, the Ash'ari Shafi'i and the Hanafi Fuqaha school, they included the issue of the figurative in uh, their topics of the Sulu Fiqh. But even though if you look at Imam Shafi's al Risala, uh, there's no mention of figurative, right? Uh, because uh, obviously this idea of the figurative did not exist amongst the Salaf. Be that as it may, it exists in the Sulu Fiqh, and there's some scholars who hold the existence of the figurative, and so therefore we should be aware of. Uh, how to uh, understand that. So, what is the definition of the literal or al haqiqa? Well, the literal is defined as what the word uh, is what the word was initially intended for. And the majaz would be uh, what the word was later used for. So, you know, literal, literal and figurative refer to Literal and figurative return, refer to the meaning of the word, okay? So they said that if you use the word as the meaning as it was in, the word was initially intended for, then it's a literal. But if you use it for a meaning which was later used for, it becomes figurative. Who can see a problem with this definition? Okay, that's you close, but you haven't hit, hit, got some money yet, huh? Yeah, and who, who knows the original? I mean, and that's the whole point. I mean, that shows, one of the, it shows the falsity of this division. That when you say that, okay, this word was, for instance, I'll give you an example. The word Asad. Asad. <coughs> all right? If I say, Ra'aytu uh, Asad. I saw. Okay, and Asad. Ra'aytu. Ra'aytu Asad. Okay? Now, if I was in the jungles of Africa, I mean, I mean what? Huh? The lion, okay. But if I saw one of these strong brothers and so forth, I said, right to Asadin, right? What do I mean? Huh? A strong man, okay. Now, 
So they would say that when you mean the lion, you're, you're referring to uh, the initial, the literal meaning. But when you say, I saw um, an Esed um, in the sense of um, uh, a strong brother, this is a figurative. Or in the English language, uh, even though this, this meaning is probably not, not good for the shitty accent, but uh, as an example, you said, I saw an angel, okay, in the English language. Uh, in the English language, you can mean that I saw actually an angel, one of Allah's manaika, right? Or you could say you meant that you saw a beautiful woman who is called in the English language an angel, okay? So which one is uh, the literal meaning and which one is the figurative meaning? I mean, who knows that the first people who spoke the Arabic language actually got down together and said, okay, we're going to call this animal a lion. And then somebody thought, well, this guy's strong and he's sort of like this strong animal, so we're going to call him an asset figuratively. Or the, in the English language, which one came first? Uh, Obviously, I mean, there's no way to determine that. And that sort of shows the falsity of this type of division. But anyway, it exists. So, when the word is used uh, as it initially was intended for, in the initial meaning it was intended for, they referred that to it as a haqiqah. And then when, it was, when it's used, uh, in meaning which later was adopted, it's called al-majaz. All right? Now, the rule is, and this is the point which is important for Surah Al-Fiqh. The rule is, is that we interpret... I'm going to put it over here so it doesn't right. We interpret... Uh, meanings to be literal unless there exists an evidence that it is figurative. That's the rule for Sula Sula. In other words, you come across a verse in the Quran or a statement to prophesy Salam. The rule is that you should interpret it as the literal meaning unless there is an evidence which shows that the intent of the speaker, whether it's Allah Azawajal or the Prophet Sallallahu right, was something figurative. Majaz. If we accept the existence of the figurative in the first place. I mean, there are some scholars who won't even accept this rule because they say everything is literal. There's no thing called figurative in the Arabic line. All right? But let's just uh, take it for the other opinion. All right? Yes? Uh, we interpret meaning to be literal unless there exists an evidence that uh, it is figurative. Now, the literal meanings are three types. Okay, so the literal is three types. Uh, the first one is the what is defined by the Sharia. The second one is what is defined by the Arabic language. And the third is what is defined by custom. So what is defined by the Sharia? I'm going to write it up here. Just so you all can see it. It's known as Al-Haqiqa Al-Shari'a. And what it means is a word which the Sharia has defined. Can anybody think of a word that the Sharia has defined? Salah, good. What else? Zakah, what else? Psalm. Okay. In the Arabic language, 
In the Arabic language, right, the word salah means dua. The word means, in the Arabic language, the word salah means dua. Just to make dua, okay? So, if we came across a verse, right, that said, establish the salah. Huh? Do we interpret it as establish, make dua? No, the first thing we do is we, we do it by the definition of sharia. Wudu, in the Arabic language, means to wash one's hands. That's it. But the sharia means to wash one's hands, one's face, right? Wipe one's head, wash one's arms, wash one's feet. Okay. So, if we come across the word wudu in a hadith, for instance, how do we interpret it? According to the sharia definition. Now, if the Sharia has not given it a definition, then we give it the Arabic definition, according to the Arabic language. And this is known as Al-Haqiqa al lughawiya Al-Haqiqa al lughawiya an example would be the word sun or moon or menses. Right? These are all terms which the Sharia has not defined but has satisfied <coughs> with the meaning understood in the Arabic language. Sharia has not given a specific definition, okay? When the Prophet Sallallahu said, Fast when you see the new crescent, right? And break your fast when you see the new crescent of Shawal, right? The idea of the new crescent, the Hilal, did the Sharia define a special meaning for it? No. It sufficed with what was understood by the Arabs in their language. Okay? And finally we come to that which is defined by custom, by the people's custom. And this is Al-Haqiqa Al-Urfiya. Al-Urfiya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala In Surah Al-Baqarah says, وَمْسِكُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Hold them, in your wives, in ma'roof, in that which is good. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And to your parents, do good. What is good here? What does it mean to hold one's wife in good. In other words, when one's married to her, to treat her well. What is well, what is good? Well, this is something which is, goes back to the custom of the people. In other words, the custom determines what is good treatment. And the custom of the people determines what is ill treatment. All right? In some societies, for a wife to get up in the morning and milk the cows, right? or whatever the goats are, uh, and till the fields that's considered to be, right, good, huh? and that's considered to be normal treatment or the normal rule for a wife, okay? In London, if you ask your wife, for those brothers who are married, to get up in the morning and take care of your car, right, fill it up with gas or whatever, and wash it or, you know, that'd be considered, right, ill treatment of your wife because the custom of the people right is that this is not really part of the division of labor between husband and wife and the wife gets up in the morning and starts scrubbing the car feeding the gas huh or petrol you understand gas petrol yeah no I mean it's not the question of the good or the bad of the custom the question is what is understood by people right Well, 
Right. I mean, obviously, if, if, the, tre- if the treatment of the custom goes against the Sharia, then it's discounted. But the point is, is that there's a certain amount of, I mean, for instance, uh, probably in some societies, uh, part of being good to your parents is to sit with them every day. All right. But probably in a very rapid pace society, like uh, a person living in the United States or in the United Kingdom, uh, it is not practical, okay, for a son or a daughter to sit and have a meal with their parents every day, maybe because they live on other ends of the town or whatever. Can that son or daughter be thought of as being, uh, you know, uh, not good to his parents, not righteous to his parents? No. Uh, perhaps if, you know, if he calls the parents every day, that's enough for righteousness. So it changes between time and place and so forth. Uh, obviously, the custom is against the Sharia, and that's discounted. Okay? So if the custom is like, for instance, to, you know, uh, uh, custom of people to speak rudely to one's parents, well, Allah has forbidden that in the Sharia, so that's not taken into consideration. But the point is, is that when one comes across the interpreting of the text of the Sharia, one does not go to the figurative meaning if we accept its existence, unless there's an evidence we interpret it according to the literal meaning. And first we look if there is a Sharia defined meaning. If not, we look for the linguistical meaning. And if not, we go to the custom, the understanding of the custom. Question? I'm just scratching your head from my Okay, so this would be in a case of <coughs> figurative meaning. Uh, if we do accept it, figurative meaning, have a client. Anyway, the regulations regarding literal and figurative meanings, you can find it on page 15, okay, of your booklet. The, princi- the principle governing speech is that it's to be interpreted as literal haqiqah, hence we do not charge the figurative meaning if we accept its, its existence in the Arabic language and or sharia, unless it's impossible to employ the literal meaning. Literal meanings are three types. What is defined by the sharia, shari'a, what is defined by the language, lughawiya, what is defined by the custom, arfiya. And hence what the lawgiver has ruled and defined it is required to employ the sharia definition. However, what the lawgiver has ruled but not defined, sufficing by its apparent lexical meaning, it is required to employ the lexical meaning. And what neither has meaning in the sharia or the language is required to refer back to the custom and practice of the people the lawgiver might clearly specify to return these matters to custom, like commanding good, living well with one's wife, and similar matters. That's the whole <coughs> subject. Okay, let's go to the next topic uh, very quickly. And that is the general, the specific, uh, the general is known as an am, while the specific is known as a khas. provide a working definition for both. Um, now, an am is that wording, the general, definition of general, that wording which is 
inclusive to all its members. The wording which is inclusive to all its members. Uh, in Surah Al-Mutafifin, does anybody know that has a number of Mutafifin? 83? Okay. In the 83rd Surah, Surah Al-Mutafifin, Allah says, إِنَّ الْأَبْرَارَ لَفِي نَعِيمٍ The Abrar which means the righteous are in Naim, pleasure or paradise. In al Abrar la fi Naim. So, here the word al Abrar, the righteous, is general. It's known as something which is an Am. Does it mean just some righteous? Or does it mean all the righteous? It means all the righteous. Surah 83. Uh, if somebody can look in the Quran, what number the verse would be good. So they can put it for the brothers to don't have one. Should be about 10 or something like that. 22? Okay. So in Surah 83, verse number 22, Allah says, The Abrar are in Na'im. In al Abrar are in Na'im. So the word here, Al Abrar, is known as Lafun Am, a general word, in the sense that it is not disregarding some of the righteous, right? But it implies all the righteous. Anybody who has this quality of righteousness will be in paradise. Alright? Now, and so therefore, the first topic regarding Al-Am is what are the uh, words that indicate uh, Al-Am, okay? I mean, what are the words that if we use them, it's indicative that the meaning is Al-Am? Well, the first type, these are the forms, these are the forms of the command of prohibition, these are the forms of Al-Am. The first type uh, is words which indicate generality by their meaning. An example would be the word kul. This word kul means every. Okay, so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna kulla shay'in khalaqnahu bi qadr We have created kull everything in qadr, in a measure. Right? This word kull in the Arabic language teaches us that nothing comes out of that. Okay? Another word similar to kul is Jamia. Jamia. Another word is Kafa. Kafa. Another word is Kafiba. These words in the Arabic language, whenever you find them in a sentence, whether the Quran or the Hadith or elsewhere, is indicative that of general means every single thing falls under that ruling. What other examples? I gave my little book for us to belabor the point.
Okay? So you see the... Um, if you look on page 32... I gave five, or the author gave five examples of wording which indica- is indicative of the generality of a text. Okay. Um, now, do, do we know what the word indefinite means as opposed to definite? All right, the indefinite means when it's not specified. So, um, as an example of number uh, choice number four, the indefinite when mentioned in a neg- negative, in a nephi, right, would be like, La ilaha illallah. This is an example for number four. Uh, when we say, La ilaha illallah, the word ilaha over here is what is known as the indefinite or the nekira. The nekira. which is known as the indefinite in the English language. And it's come in a negation because it has the word la before it, right? So when a negative, when an indefinite comes in a sentence, which is a neg- negative sentence, it therefore implies generality. So when you say la ilaha illallah, there's no God but Allah, right? Here God means every single God worshipped by people or deified by people, huh? Not just some as opposed to others. But because it is an indefinite, right, and it's come in, under, in a negative sentence, okay, it then therefore is inclusive for all the different types. Anyway, uh, there are a number of types of, um, there are a number of types of the uh, general statements. And if I find time before I leave, since there are seven forms, I'll write them down on a piece of paper, to a photocopy, okay? But for me to go through them now, uh, which is we don't have enough time, okay? But let's take the, the usul al uh, So there are seven forms of uh, the, um, uh, the, um, what do you call the general, okay? We did form number one, when it has words which indicate generality by their meaning. So you can put in your notes uh, two through seven, okay? And inshallah, if I find time before I leave, I'll write them on a piece of paper and we'll photocopy them, and then you guys will all have a copy to just add to your notes. So there's two through seven. The wording which is indicate inclusive, of, uh, the, the wordings which indicate generality, all right, or the forms of uh, which are indicated. Now, the next rule which we want to discuss regarding generality is that the next thing we want to discuss is that acting upon the general. <coughs> and this refers to something that the brother asked me a day ago, maybe yesterday, a couple days ago, that what if the verse was revealed concerning a specific incident what do we do? Do we act upon it? Do, or do we say that we uh, act upon it only if we come to that specific incident? Or do we take it in the general sense? The rule is, is that we act if the wording is general. We apply it generally unless there's a specific evidence to show that it's meant only for a specific reason. Okay? So let me give you an example. Um, um, the verses regarding Lihau. And Lihau, again the Z over here is pronounced Law. And Lihau means when you tell your wife you are like my mother's back. In other words, you're preventing yourself from having sexual relations with your wife by resembling her to your mother. This is a way of divorce that the pagan Arabs used to do. If they would want to divorce one of their women in times of Jahiliya, they would say to their wife, you, to me, is like my mother's back. It's like a man would not have sex with his mother. I mean, I would not have sex with you, so you're divorced. So, according to the Sharia, 
if somebody re- resembles his wife to his mother's back or to any part of her mother or any woman which is forbidden for him to have sex with like a sister, like a grandmother, like an aunt this is called avlihar now, the verses regarding avlihar were revealed concerning a specific companion of the Prophet Sallallahu can we now say that, well, those verses were revealed concerning him, so if somebody says it now, it's inapplicable. Why not? Okay, but the rule, you got the bottom part of the rule, the first part of the rule, huh? But the rule is we act upon the generality of the text unless there is a specific evidence to show otherwise, like you mentioned, okay? The rule is we act upon the generality of the text unless there is a specific rule to act otherwise. Again, the rule is we act upon the generality of the text unless there is a specific rule to show otherwise. Yes? No, because you see, it was revealed because a companion did so, so Allah used that incident to show the ruling that it's forbidden in the Sharia and that a kafara and expiation must be done. But, the point is, can then somebody say, well, that was revealed concerning him, and so it sticks with him, it doesn't apply to me. And that comes over here, if you look at your booklets, on page 32, after the wording indicative of generality, I put the regulation, which the person, uh, or I transferred the regulation, uh, which the, uh, was asked of the other day, where consideration lies with the generality of the wording of a text, not a specific cause of legislation. And ibra bi umum al la bi khusus al-sabab. So somebody cannot say that, well, it was revealed concerning this, so it doesn't apply uh, for here. But rather, an ibra is a moment left. La khusus al-sabab. All right, now let's take... Uh, let's take the uh, specific or khas. Well, if... How do we define the general? Uh-huh. What? No, that's, that's how it appears, but what was the definition of the general? Right. So then therefore the specific, the khas, is the meaning which is just for some of its members, right? It's, just, it's the opposite of the general, okay? So the specific is defined as that wording which is indicative of only some of its members. And the specific, again, has a number of forms to show us uh, that it's specific. But I want to give just one example of specific just to help us understand um, it and then we'll... uh, I'll go forward. Uh, and again, if I get a chance to write down the forms of specific, I'll write it down for you. Like I will write down the forms of the Aram, inshallah. Allah says in the Quran, Awal Asr, my time, in al insana, lafi khus. By time, verily, man is lost, meaning that humanity will go to the hellfire. Al insan here, Okay, is what is known as an am. It's known as an am. It means all human beings will go to hell. All right. Well, in the and the reason why it is uh, it, because it's one of those forms which is indicative in the Arabic language of generality. Okay. Now, we see number five on the um, on page thirty-two, which fits into that category, an insan. Now. Allah then says, Illa, Illa alladheena amanu wa aminu salihat wa tawasaw bil haqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. Right? So this word, Illa, accept, okay, is one of the forms which is indicative of what is known as takhsis. Takhsis. And takhsis takhsis is the process 
of taking something which is am general, right, and reducing it to something more specific. So here, had Allah not revealed the following verse, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمِنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Right? We would say that everybody was going to hell. Because Allah says, وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُصْرِ And according to the Arabic language, the word insan over here, because of the existence of the alaf lam, uh, and it's not just of a single person, but of every single person. So, all, we would say, if translated in English, verily all of humanity, right, is going to what meaning hell. But then Allah says, in that, except those who have faith and those who do righteous deeds and those who encourage the truth and those who encourage the patience. Okay. So, the form in that is one of the matters that causes taqsir. Alright? And so therefore, uh, it makes that general, which is inclusive of every single human being, to inclusive of those human beings which do not possess those four qualities. Right? You all with me? or Okay. So the rule is, as follows. You open page 17 of your booklets. Brothers, look here. Among the texts of the Quran and the Sunnah are those which are general, am, and those which are, which are the specific majority of the text. And there are others which are specific, khas. If you have a text which is am, so how do we deal with general and specific text? General and specific text. If we have a text which is general and another which is specific, and we can apply each of them, that's what we do. We apply the general for the general, and we apply the specific for the specific. But if these two texts are contradictory, in other words, there's no way you can apply them both, we then take the specific text, right, to specify the general text. Do we understand the rule? Okay. If we have two texts, one general and one specific, one general and one specific, we can apply both of them, we apply both of them. We apply the general for the general and the specific for the specific. But if we cannot apply them both because one, uh, because their meanings are incongruent, we then specify the general with the specific. We specify the general with the specific. Right, no, we say that the general meaning, the implication by the general, right, has been specified by the specific. Huh? No, i give you an example, like this verse we did over here, okay? Okay, we cannot say that everybody's going to hell, okay, and some people are going to paradise, and, but yet everybody's going to hell. It doesn't make sense, right? Huh? Right? They're mutually exclusive. So therefore, in this case, we have to take this specific, right, and specify the general, say that means it means all those people who do not possess the qualities of the specific. Okay? Uh, let me think of a good example. All right, here, here's an example which might make it easier to understand. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, there will remain... a group of my ummah upon the truth right till the day of judgment till the day of judgment
And the Prophet ﷺ said, the day of judgment, or not until the day of judgment, until the hour is established, until the hour is established. The hour is established. And he said another hadith, the hour will be established upon the most evil of humanity. These two texts are mutually exclusive. There's no way you can have them both at the same time. There will remain a group of my own upon the truth until the hour is established. So if they're upon the truth, that means they're people who are good, right? And that the hour will be established upon the most evil of humanity. Well, how could that be? I mean, there's going to be people of, of the Ummah upon the truth. So, both hadith are sahih. So then, therefore, I mean, this doesn't necessarily apply to an Amal al khas, but I'm just trying to something which is mutually exclusive, right? We therefore have to take one of them and interpret it in some way. So, I mean, based upon other hadith, uh, they interpret the first hadith to mean uh, till near the establishment of the hour, based upon other hadith. Okay? So what, going back to our example of the general and the specific, if we can apply the general text in its general sense and the specific text in a specific sense, that's well and fine. But if they are mutually exclusive, whereby which you cannot apply them both, we then take the general and we specify it with a specific. Yes? No, I think this is probably um, probably by the Arabic the Arabic test. This is probably more general. Okay. Yeah, there's like a hadith about the wind blowing and taking whoever is in the soul has a particle of faith and so forth. Of what hadith? That it doesn't mean that the hour is exactly established, but it means just prior to the establishment of the hour. Okay, now let us um, continue. I know uh, we maybe have gone over, but you don't mind if we take a few more minutes because of. Okay, with everybody? Because I'll give you a break for about 10 minutes, but because we're running out of time. Uh, for this class. Uh, let's take the next one, which is the absolute and the qualified. Okay, so what was the rule about the general and specific text? The last rule? Let me say to me. If you can apply them both, you apply the general for the general, the specific, specific. If they're mutually exclusive, you do what? Okay, and then you'll find that on page 17. Uh, let's take now the absolute and the qualified. <coughs> the absolute and the qualified. Well, the absolute... Uh, is known as al mutlaq and the qualified al mutlaq and the qualified is known as al muqayyid muqayyid So the absolute is al-mutlaq and the qualified is al-muqayyid. Let us uh, give a definition for both. Uh, 
All right. If you look at uh, the mutlaq means uh, that which has no uh, description given to it. It's just an absolute meaning. All right. So it's the absolute. The mutlaq can be defined as uh, that which has not been qualified with a description or a condition. That's the definition of a mutlaq. A verse comes, a hadith comes, which is not qualified, it's not made more specific by a description or by a condition, a shop, number shop. Now, if it is uh, qualified with a description or a condition, it's then known as a muqayyid. Uh, the the mutlaq example would be source in mujadila, uh, which is what number is like 66, 67, 64. Do I check mujadila? Fifty-eight, fifty-eight. Okay. Surah 58, verse number 3. In Surah 58, verse number 3, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَتَحْرِيرُ رَقَبَ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَتَمَاسَ The letting free of a neck, which means a slave, before they have sexual relations with them. Letting free of a slave before they have sexual relations. Here, Slave, is it absolute or is it specified? Or is it uh, qualified? Huh? Absolute doesn't tell us what kind of slave. Release a slave, okay? But if you go to Surah Nisa, Surah 4, verse 92, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَتَحْرِيرُ رَقَبَةٍ مُؤْمِنَةٍ So set free a believing slave. This is an example of something which is qualified or specified, right? Mukhayyid. Okay, the first one in Surah al Mujadira in 58.3 was just a slave, released a slave over here, a believing slave. Okay? And the rule is. Just like the general, that if a verse or a hadith is mutlaq, we act upon the mutlaq unless there comes something which qualifies it, okay, and results for us to qualify it. So therefore, it's understood now that this verse qualifies this verse. Why? Because both is regarding setting free a slave. The same ruling of setting free a slave. And so therefore, when anybody wants to set free a slave in the Sharia, one of the stipulations is that the slave must be believing. Had we looked at only this verse alone, you could, you could set free a Christian slave, a Jewish slave, a Hindu slave, right? But because of this verse, qualifies it to being a believing slave. Okay, yes? Okay, because it both is dealing with the same ruling, setting free. So in this case, we're required to qualify the mukhlaq with the muqayyid. But had it been for uh, two desperate rulings, we could apply the mukhlaq where it's mukhlaq and we could apply the muqayyid. Where it's muqayyid, I'll give you an example for that. Um, When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ma'idah Surah Al-Ma'idah verse 38 that the thief male or female cut off their hands فَقْتَعُوا أَيْدِيَهُمَا And then in the same surah 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, alright, in Surah 5, verse number 6, regarding wudu, فَاغْسِلُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ وَأَيْدِيَكُمْ إِلَى الْمَرَافِقِ Wash your hands, أَيْدِيَكُمْ to the marafiq, to your elbows. Okay? Here, in Surah 538, okay, Allah says, cut off their hands. Which is the general, which is the, excuse me, which is the absolute, which is the qualified? Five what? Five thirty-eight is absolute. The Allah says, cut off their hands. Five six says, wash your hands, right? To the elbows. Now, can we now qualify this uh, absolute meaning with this verse? And then, so therefore, when we cut off the thief's yed, we cut it off from the elbow? Why not? Because there are two different rulings. And unlike over here, when it's about freeing the slave, it's one ruling. Okay? Because, I mean, you know, because the word yed in the Arabic language is inclusive from here to here. When you say the word yed in the Arabic language, it's inclusive from here to here. So it includes this, includes this, and includes up to here. So when Allah says, cut off their hand, their, 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 their ad, <coughs> the plural of word yed, I mean, it's absolute. It could mean cutting it here. It could mean cutting it here. And it could mean cutting it here. At the shoulder. In the wudu, Allah says, wash the A.D. until the marafiq, until the elbows. We cannot qualify this absolute one with this. Because one deals with wudu and one deals with dealing with a thief. No, it's qualified by the sunnah of the Prophet by his sunnah, the sunnah of his companions, in, in his presence, by just cutting it off from the wrist. But the Arabic language, the word yad, in the Arabic language, to the people of the time of the Prophet Muhammad I mean, does not mean just this. It means what, what we call the arm. And when we translate in English, we assume the qualified meaning of the translation, so we say cut off their hands. But if you look at it literally, if you do a literal translation of the verse, it would be cut off their arms. Okay, so regarding that, again, page 17, among the texts of the Quran and the Hadith are absolute, mutlaq, and qualified by a description or some type of recognized quality, and hence, one delineates, or in other words, <coughs> explains the absolute text by the qualified text. And the rule is when does that when the ruling is different? The same. When the ruling is the same. But when the ruling is different, like over here, one applies the absolute and applies the uh, qualified to their specific cases. Okay. So that gives you ten minutes now to have a break. Sorry for taking this time, but we have to make up. So I shall be back in ten minutes to start, Sean. Is that okay?